Psalm 132. The Lord's been speaking to me from this psalm for <clears throat> some time. The Lord used it to, uh, to open my heart <clears throat> to several things. One is an explanation of what David was when God said that he had a heart after God. <clears throat> because in my reckoning before this, having a heart after God was simply that you really loved God and you wanted to go after him. <clears throat> Therefore, most of us would have a heart after God, but <clears throat> the Spirit of God began to show me that there was something specific about David and that that, <clears throat> that thing that was in his heart endeared him to the Lord. I'll be honest with you, I, was, I picked up my Bible this morning and was just looking at a few scriptures, <clears throat> excuse me, in a sense unrelated, not unrelated, but certainly not what I was planning on sharing and probably won't share. But the Spirit of God began to show me <clears throat> some incredible realities in relationship to David and his heart after God and God's response to it. Um, I do want to say that I have a real question if I'm going to be able to truly communicate this. <clears throat> and I may start feeling that way every time I share, <laughs> because I did last time too. And, um, but it is my desire not just to <clears throat> be a good preacher or a good teacher or someone who can communicate truth real well, but that for the heart of God and the reality of God to be communicated to people, more than just information, more than just another sermon. And so um, <clears throat> before we read this, let me say, David's references are all to building a house for God. <clears throat> and the Bible says that now in the new covenant, because that was the old covenant and the old covenant passed away, in the new covenant we are the house of God. <clears throat> we are the temple of God. And many Christians just look at that like some sort of a um, symbolism but in reality, the scriptures are clear, even in their explanations, that Christ is supposed to live his life through us. And that living in the new covenant is this reality. <clears throat> that Jesus didn't just come, die, go back up to heaven and save us. But, he, but for everyone who is truly his, he came into them. He came inside of them. And he came in to live his life because, just frankly, we can't live it. And, um, but even more importantly than that, <clears throat> because this seed, this one, this Christ, is the one that pleases the Father, always has and always will, and therefore, for anyone who has a desire to please the Father, they would eventually look to this one who only completely pleases the Father. Jesus said, <clears throat> I think it was John 8, I do always those things that please the Father. And so there is this reality of us becoming his house. And the, in the Old Testament, it was called the tabernacle, it was called the temple, but it was always called the house of God. All of that, just a shadow, all of that, <clears throat> a picture of things to come upon whom the ends of the earth they pertain to, so that we would not just be Christian, which is a term used twice, I think, <laughs> in the Bible. Whereas being the house of God will blow your mind how many times it's used. <clears throat> uh, and so let's read Psalm 132. 
This is David speaking. He's praying. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. This is David speaking. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. <clears throat> Though we heard of it in Ephra Ephrathah, we found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. And then let's drop down to verse uh, <clears throat> 13. Some other time we'll deal with some of the rest of these scriptures. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. <clears throat> and um, if you know the story, that Zion was actually the place when David brought the ark to and set up a tent, and it was called David's Tabernacle. <clears throat> and there, anybody could come, and there were people that came that were foreigners. They were not Jews. But they came and they worshiped, and on and on and on. And there's a whole set of truths with all of that. But that God uh, had a desire from the very beginning, and those of you who were in my last time when I shared about the, the tabernacle in the wilderness, he had a desire for a house. And one of the other times I'll share on this, but David came up, it just came into his heart, and we'll read a few more scriptures on that, but it came into his heart to build a house for God. And Nathan the prophet said, man, go do what's in your heart. But then God spoke to Nathan and said, go tell David these things. And God, right after that, built a covenant, made a covenant with David that would last for all eternity. Based on one thing. David figured out that God wanted a house. And in that discourse that Nathan got from God to David, he said, nobody at any time ever spoke about a house for me or the need for a house. Nobody ever brought up the subject for me, but you have, and I'm going to make this covenant with you now. Strictly based on one thing, that one man out of all the people of the earth, and, and the way God words that is, from the very time way back here to right now, not one person ever brought it up. And it sounds like he's not interested in the house. But what he's saying is that he is amazed that David figured out that that's really what he wanted. And that what he eternally wanted. And <clears throat> sometime later we'll get into it all of the meaning of that, but it's incredible truth. <clears throat> and do me a favor, keep your place here because this, this is going to be our main scriptures. But I want you to go to uh, First Chronicles chapter 28. Remember, keep your place there, don't lose it because we're coming back. First Chronicles. We're going to read verse 2. <clears throat> then David the king stood upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God, and had made ready for the building. Now I want you to notice, <clears throat> David said, I had in my heart to build a house of rest 
So there's two things there for the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented the actual real presence of God. In other words, there was this tabernacle, there was all this furniture, and all this way of worshiping. There was an altar, and you could kill animals and do all this stuff, which represented the cross. There was the laver. There were all these other things. None of those actually had the very actual presence of God there. They were all types and shadows and symbols. But the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, God was there. And that Ark not only represented God in His presence on this earth, but had God in His presence on this earth. And so David has figured out, and <clears throat> we'll, give you a few, we'll, we'll give you a few reasons how he figured it out in today's sharing. <clears throat> but David figured out <clears throat> and had it in his heart to build God a house of rest. Not for the candlestick or the table of showbread or anything else in that tabernacle, but for the ark, meaning literally for God to build on this earth a house of rest. And that's, that rest is important, and I don't want to get into that right now. And all these things I do intend on sharing. <clears throat> but it wasn't just a house. It was a house of rest for God. Seems a little amazing, doesn't it? And yet, that's, that's the story. All right, let's go back to Psalms 132. We read that last scripture just to show you that David, uh, as well as these scriptures, is saying, I had it in my heart, and God said, I have found David, a man with a heart after me. <clears throat> and David begins to show what was in his heart. Because it's interesting, God says David has a heart after, or, of God, a heart after God. And all the references to David's heart surround him making a habitation. Now you can, in the Old Covenant, you can say he made a building. <clears throat> right? In the Old Covenant, David made a building, or, or Solomon did, but David did make a place for him, and that was the tabernacle of David. Folks, in the New Covenant, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to have the heart of David, and we're supposed to make ourselves into the house of God where he can live and have his thoughts lead the house in his way and to manifest himself and to find rest within us. And so I really honestly, I was so deeply moved by this thing of the heart that David found this reality without being told by anybody else. He discovered something of God because we're, we're wanting God to meet all of our needs. We're wanting God to do all these great things for us. We're wanting God to figure out our desires and doing it. But David was completely different than everybody else. David figured out something that nobody else had ever said. And so I began to just ask the, the because, and I'll, let me just make this statement. Some people have said over the years, Randy, you have a, you have a heart like David. You have a heart after God. But I'm going to tell you that the clearest seeing of what was in God's heart for a house, for a, to make us a habitation, I didn't see that in the heart of God. I saw it in the heart of David. I'm just being honest with you. I didn't see it for myself like David did. But I did see it in the heart of David, and it's, it's come into me that God would have a habitation. <clears throat> And so I just began to ask the Lord, where did he get this from? How did he see this? How did just somebody out of the blue all of a sudden appear and saw the very desires of the heart of God? And instead of, I mean, David built himself a cedar house. We read that. And then he said, you know, this is not, you know, how can I be happy in my own house that God gave me while God doesn't have a resting place? And he said, I'm not going to rest until God rests. And I'm not going to enjoy my house until God can enjoy his house. <clears throat> and so, as I looked in the scriptures, I began to realize that, that David came to this, this um, understanding and this heart to build a, a house for God by three different means. 
One is by his experience, the other one is by his history, knowing the history just prior, and the third one is knowing the scriptures. <clears throat> and so I want to look at um, David's experience, and we probably won't cover all these today, but I want you to just see from David's own words where he got this. From David's experience, he saw the need in the heart of God that he wanted us to be a habitation. Not just a Christian nation, a habitation. Not just a people, because he didn't just want Israel to be a people, folks. <clears throat> he wanted them to be the place of his habitation. Even the scriptures that we quote where it says <clears throat> we're a peculiar people, <clears throat> I don't care how weird you are, that doesn't apply to you <clears throat> in, your, in your weirdness, okay? Every time it refers to being a peculiar people, it's talking about priests. And priests, as it were, particularly in Solomon's temple, lived in, in the temple and served the heart of God, served the needs from within. And, and I want to get off into all that, but that's, that's just a fact. <clears throat> and so David, who, who also carried an ephod, like a priest. And he was at the house of Judah. And he took Urim and Thummim and, and, and uh, consulted God through these means that only priests were supposed to have access to. This guy went into the Holy of Holies in spirit. This guy didn't just hang out in the outer court of the court of the Gentiles. This guy went in and saw what was really there in God's heart. And it began to move him. And so uh, but, but again, in what way did he do it? Well, first by experience. In uh, Psalm 132, or if you're back there now. Um, let's look at verse... Um, let's see. Where did, it's verse uh, 6 and 7. <clears throat> let's, let's read 5, 6, and 7. Psalm 132. Until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of, of Jacob. Now, before I address that, let me, know, let me point out something. He's used this phrase, the mighty God of Jacob, twice in here. Uh, verse 2, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into my tabernacle, my house, nor go up to my bed. And then verse 5, until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. <clears throat> Folks, the mighty God of Jacob is specific. It's not just God in general. Do you remember Jacob? Jacob was a guy who had all sorts of flaws. Jacob was a guy who flaked out all the time. J Jacob was a man who went in his own strength for God and failed over and over. Okay? And so God finally dealt with Jacob and turned him into a guy named Israel, prince with God. This, is, this was... The beauty of this mighty God of Jacob is that he was there and he wrestled with God. Jacob wrestled with God and God touched his hip, took him out, brought his strength down. And when, they, uh, when Jacob rose up from that wrestling with God, he limped. His walk was now weak. Now he depended on God and he became Israel. How did he become Israel? How did he become a prince with God? by getting stronger, by God touching him and great power coming out of him. Folks, that is not the mighty God of Jacob. The mighty God of Jacob touched him all right. But he didn't go, yeah, now I'm a mighty God. Now I've got the power. And if you'll follow me, the Lord will, you know, come to me. I'm the one with the power. He said, to, you know, forget it. I don't have any power. I don't have any strength anymore. I'm walking in weakness. The only thing I have is this God that was the God of Jacob that is now the God of Israel. And two times here it says that because he's building this out of weakness, not out of strength. <clears throat> okay, so he goes on in verse uh, 6. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrathah, and we found it in the fields of the woods. And I thought, that, those are just weird verse that's a weird verse you know <clears throat> I mean that just 
to me, I, out of everything that's here, it's all talking about this, that, that David found it in his heart to build God this habitation and all the things that relate to it and how he's discovered that the Lord loved Zion, that the Lord loved the place that was going to be his habitation, that the Lord desired it for a habitation and all this. And then it says, lo, we found it in Ephratha and in the field of the woods. And so, I, you know, you're not going to get a whole lot there except, uh, again, keep your place here in Psalms and let's go to Genesis 35. <clears throat> we'll just look at one verse here. <clears throat> Genesis 35, and interestingly enough, this is dealing with Jacob coming back out, and there's a lot here, and so I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to point out one, one thing, but this is where Rachel, his wife, travails to bring forth Benjamin, and she dies, and Benjamin comes forth. And then verse 19, and Rachel died and was buried in the way of Ephrathah, which is Bethlehem. Ephrathah, folks, is Bethlehem. Okay? So David is saying, now what, what is the city of David? For unto us is born in the city of David, Bethlehem. Okay? All right, let's go back to... Uh, uh, Psalms now, Psalm 132. <clears throat> Lo, we heard of it in Ephrathah. What I believe that that is referring to is that David grew up in Bethlehem. He grew up, that was his home, and he loved it. And you can tell that from different stories that, you know, that he loved that place. And that even the water from the well that he drank there, he had fond memories and thought about it when he was on the run. <clears throat> you remember that? And, and uh, so while he was there, while he was growing up, while he was just a boy, while he was keeping his father's sheep, and you can, you can read of his psalms, there are psalms written when he was just a boy. I mean, most people think uh, Psalm uh, 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shot, he wrote that. And then he's sitting out in the fields and he's watching the sheep and he's being a shepherd and all of a sudden he goes, you know what? I'm not just a shepherd to these, my father's sheep, but the Lord is my shepherd. And as a young man knew the Lord and, and knew the warmth of a, of a home and of, of family and of love and, and being there with, with everybody and having a stable home life. And so that was, you know, most of us don't appreciate stuff like that until we lose it. <clears throat> and so later on, though, you know, he went to take his brother some food, and there was a giant there, and David defeated him, Goliath. But then Saul began to get jealous and began to chase David off. And so David couldn't even stay in Israel at first. And he was on the run, and, and Saul was trying to kill him, and Saul had all these people looking for him, and there were all these spies, and there were all these people reporting to him. And now, where is David living? Well, I would have said David is living in the wilderness where it's just dry and rocky and, okay. I mean, that's, that's my, when I read the wilderness, that's what I think. But I decided to look up a few scriptures. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel, keeping your place there again in 1 Samuel now. And let's do 1 Samuel 22 first. <clears throat> Now, I think I'll read just a little bit of this so you'll get a picture like I did. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 22, David therefore departed from there and escaped, this is verse 1, David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave Abdullah. And how many of you know David went to the cave Abdullah and, and that's, that was a big deal? Well, in my mind, he went there and stayed for months and years, okay? Because it was seven years before he even became king over Judah, much less the whole nation. Uh, and when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him, and everyone who was distressed and everyone 
who is in debt, and everyone who is discontented gather themselves unto him. Sort of sounds like this place, but never mind. And he became a captain over them, and there was with him about uh, 400 men. Now look at verse 3. And David went from there. He didn't stay long there in that cave anyway. <clears throat> Does anybody notice? It just mentions it in that one verse, basically, or two verses. And then he's moving on to Moab. David went from there to Mitzvah of Moab <clears throat> and basically brought his parents down. In verse 4, and he brought them before the king of Moab and they de dwelt with him all the while that David was in the stronghold. Um, and verse 5, and the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the stronghold, depart, get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Hereth. First of all, this was an eye-opener to me that he didn't stay in that cave very long and he didn't stay in Moab very long, but he went into these woods where was a forest and you remember David said, and in the woods, this is where I learned of it. Now let me give you chapter 23 and verse 15 and 16. <clears throat> um... And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in the forest. It says the wilderness was a forest. Okay, so I'm just, I'm, right now I'm just giving you just facts, just historical facts. Most of us think that he was either in a cave or out in a desert. And the scriptures that I started finding were showing that he was in the wood. Now let's go back. Let's go back to Psalm 132 where it states that again. <clears throat> Verse 6, Lo, we heard of it in Ephrathah or Bethlehem. We found it. We heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of the woods. Folks, there's a progression here. We heard, David is saying, I heard of this thing about God having a home, a habitation, I heard of it in Bethlehem, but I found it when I was out on the run when Saul was chasing me down. And if you remember the situation, um, he was, you know, here he is, he's running, he's having to, to sleep in the woods, he's having to sleep in caves, he's, his life is in danger, he's always having to be on alert, and this is going on for years, and this is a young man. And so here he is, all this is going on, and while he's running and he's hiding and everything, I can see David laying there at night, and I can see him thinking after several years of this, years of every night sleeping out in the woods somewhere, hiding, thinking about Bethlehem, and thinking, man, you know, having good thoughts about, man, wasn't it nice when I was in my house with my parents? with my family, with those that I love, and felt the warmth of that situation. Wasn't that a wonderful time? Now here, he, he's just thinking about himself right now. He's just thinking how good it was to have a house. And not only to have a house, but David was never at rest. His life was always in jeopardy. They were, there was no place. He had to be on the alert. So when he's laying there, and you remember the, the Bible says that he didn't even sleep among the men. He would sleep out alone in a, in a ditch somewhere away from everything so that people, if they came and attacked the camp, they wouldn't kill him. So David was a man of war, but here he is, he's sleeping all alone, he's looking up at the same sky that he looked up when he was a kid, and he's thinking, man, it was sure nice when I had a home, it was sure nice when I had a place of rest, and I didn't have to worry about the enemy, and I didn't have to worry about being under attack and everything, and it was there in Bethlehem that he first heard of it, but it was out there in those woods that he found the truth, that he said, oh my God, and, and again, I'll share from history and some other time I'll share from the scriptures how I believe David came up with this reality, but we find by his experience he began to realize God wanted a home. He began to realize God could have just been God on a throne up in heaven and everybody could have just prayed to him. Does that sound familiar? He's just a God up in heaven and everybody prayed. But he said, God didn't want to do that. God wanted to have a habitation among us. God figured out a plan. God said, I want to come down and I want to dwell in your midst. And God said, build a tabernacle, build a temple, and let me come live in there with you. 
God was the one who wanted a habitation on this earth. God was the one, and the whole story, and again, we won't get into this, but I'll just make this, you know, this statement. The whole story of Israel in the wilderness was one primary thing. No, it wasn't to get Israel into the promised land. It was to get the Ark of the Covenant to a place of rest that he had chosen. Folks, we're the fulfillment of that. We're supposed to be the house of God. We're supposed to be where he lives in us and where he, he has his expression through us. Instead, we become Christians that, that hold up Christian principles, but there's no Christ. There's no, there's no ark. There's no presence in that sense. You know, we say he's in our heart, but he's not habiting, inhabiting us in the sense of he's living in there. We're his home. Our bodies are our home for the most part. But David is laying there and he's going, this is not comfortable. This is not good. And then he starts thinking about all this stuff. And he goes, you know what? God doesn't have a home. God doesn't have a house. God doesn't have a place of rest. God is not comfortable. And that's why they were carrying the ark all the time. And so, um, you know, these, these were some of the things that he began to meditate on. Now, let me give you some of the recent history uh, why I believe that he came up with this. Look in 1 Samuel again, except this time it's chapter 4. <clears throat> and while you're turning there, you say, well, now why is this important? It's the difference between nominal Christianity that lives for God and the very desire of the heart of God to live within his people. He called us his temple. But are we any more the temple of God than that building was the temple of God in the Old Testament? That's the question. Where he's, you know, not free to express himself and, and uh, live through us. So 1 Samuel chapter 4. Verse 1, we'll read verse 1 through 4 first. <clears throat> And this is the history. So this is, I believe David got this desire to build God a house and that God wanted a habitation. Now this is, let me make something clear. This isn't just about David's heart after God. This is David discovered in the heart of God something that he wanted. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're not talking about the great man David and his heart after God. We're talking about the heart that God says, I found me a man after my heart, is a guy who looked into the heart of God and saw the very desire of God, not just to have a people, not just to have a religion, but to have a habitation where he could live within us. And he could live, in, live his life. So, you know... Don't misread what I'm saying here. Okay, 1 Samuel 4, verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and encamped beside um, Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped at Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us. Now, Shiloh is where the tabernacle of Moses was. It was where it was set up when they first came into the land. So in Moses' tabernacle in Shiloh is the ark of the covenant in the Holy of Holies and all the other furniture. All right? So they say, Okay, well, let's go get the ark of the covenant. Uh, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. Did you hear what they said? They said, we're going to go get the Ark of the Covenant, and we're going to go out against the enemy, and we're going to win. Verse 4, so the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who dwelleth between the cherubim, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, was there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now look in verse 17. <clears throat> And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. All right, so if you, didn't, if you don't know the story, it's basically this. 
The Philistines came out to fight Israel. Israel went against them. They got defeated. They came up with this great plan. Well, let's go get the Ark of the Covenant and rush out and we'll defeat the enemies. Now, most of you, the, the biggest explanation, not most of you, but many of you, the biggest explanation you have of this story was found, is found on your understanding of the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. <clears throat> which is not really very biblical, okay? So I'm going to try to line you up a little better here, all right? You know, some of you are out of alignment. I'll be your chiropractor for today. <clears throat> and so, so, you know, Eli and the priest, the, the Hophni and Phinehas, the two that died, they were the priest's sons, the high priest's sons. They were priests. And, of course, Eli died that day, too. So they take the ark out to fight the enemy, and the enemy defeats them, beats them bad, and takes the ark of the covenant, and the Philistines take it back and put it into their tent with all their other false gods. <clears throat> all right, so what, what do we get out of this? Well, first of all, we get that the priests didn't have any clue at all about the ark and God's plan for the ark. None. Not even a little bit. <clears throat> That's why they died. Okay. They didn't have a clue what was in the heart of God. All they, and, and when this story happens, <clears throat> the, as far as the priests and the nation, when they do this, the purpose for the ark just changed. Okay. The original purpose for the ark was to give it a resting place. That's why we came all the way through Egypt and landed here. That was the purpose. But now it's all changed. We're going to go into there, take him out of his resting place, put him on our shoulders, and go run around and defeat the enemy. You know, as I said at one other, Sharon, defeat the enemy of our wallet, you know, the one who's stealing our money, you know. So we go get the ark and we go... You know, chase that or, or the, the enemy of our, you know, sicknesses that we've got. And we run him around over there. Or we want to take him and put him in our home so our homes will be blessed. And we do all that kind of stuff. And the whole purpose, no understanding at all like David had of what was in the heart of God to find a habitation, a place of rest, that that was number one, primary. The biggest reason why God even brought him out, if you will. <clears throat> so he could dwell in a people. And they missed it. And they didn't even see it. And so now, from this point on, the, the ark is going to be abused until David comes along. Okay? The ark is going to be used for every purpose except his real purpose. The church today, folks, Jesus is just like the ark. We're throwing him on our shoulders and going and chasing the enemy. I rebuke you, Satan. Get him, get him. You know, all this kind of stuff. And I'll tell you what, a whole lot of people who rebuke the devil and try to get him out, it doesn't happen. A lot of them getting more bondage than they were before. You know, the scriptures are clear on this. If there was an enemy in the house, cast him out and fill it with the Lord. It says that in the New Testament. Jesus said that. That's the plan. The plan isn't empty. The plan is filled. Okay? And so the ark, the Lord, even in churches today, is being used and used and used. And his heart and his plan to make us his habitation, not even heard of. Not even considered. People aren't even... The thought of Christ in you is almost nothing compared to the basic thing everybody's teaching. It's just minuscule. And the primary thing is everybody's going and praying to the ark, make me stronger, make me better. And he's saying, I want to empty you so I can fill you with not just the Holy Spirit so you can, you know, talk in tongues or something. I want to fill you with my life. I want to live in you. I want you to be my habitation. It's, just, it's as if this history happened to the church. 
at some juncture, somewhere along the line, we got off and somebody decided we, we're having trouble with the enemy. Let's grab him and take him out of his habitation. Folks, he never went back to that place. The ark never returned to, to Shiloh. It never returned to the tabernacle of Moses. It never went back there again. They took it up and took him out of there. And he said, you don't even understand what's in my heart. I'm not going back because you'll just pull me out again. And so um, let's go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. Second Samuel chapter 6, and we'll just read a couple of verses here. <clears throat> uh, instead of reading the whole story, I'll just sort of tell you what it is. <clears throat> David became king. Okay, now this is years after the one that we just read, okay? Many years have passed, and the ark had been taken by the Philistines. Now, here, let me just give you a funny little story here. They took the ark out of Moses' tabernacle and went against the enemy and lost, right? And, that, and the Philistines, the enemy, the uncircumcised, my God, do we not understand the uncircumcised are those who have not been, the cross has not been applied to their flesh. And they take the ark, but here's the thought. Could not the ark defeat the enemies of Israel? Of course it's stronger. Of course it can defeat the enemies of Israel. But there's something greater than defeating our enemies, and that is fulfilling God's eternal plan, that we be a habitation. That's the greater thing. And the proof of that is because when they put the ark in this big tent with all of the gods of the Philistines and Dagon and all these others, the ark, they put him in there, they come back the next day, and Dagon is down on his face, their, their false god is down on his face, they put him back up, the next day they come back and his hands and feet are cut off and he's down on his face, and I mean, you know, all of this stuff. <laughs> Finally, you know, one of their gods were these little tumor things. They had these little, they worshiped these little tumor things. They all started getting tumors. I thought you had the God of the tumor, you know, that would defeat the tumors, you know? And the ark is wreaking havoc among them. Our God is powerful, but folks, there's something more wonderful than Almighty God. And that's the Most High God. That is what God has in his heart pertaining to his purpose. And if we, if we start, if we don't understand that, we're going to start using him for all these other things and then wonder, why isn't this thing working? Has anybody ever wondered, why isn't this thing working? Come on. If, if the basic, what I see in basic Christianity is what it's all about, if that's really what it's all about, I quit. I mean, there are better religions. I mean, really, there are some better religions. But folks, Jesus didn't come to start a religion. He came to build himself a house. I will build my church. That's what he talked to, to Peter. That's what he was excited about. Who do men say I am? What are, you know? And basically, he's, they're saying, well, some say you're a prophet. Some say you're, you know, this and that. And Peter goes, you're the son of the living God. You'd think Jesus would go, whoa, you got it, baby, in that sense. He says, I will build my church. Flesh and blood is revealing to you something, and I will build my habitation, my home, my building, my temple. In other words, the church is going to be the temple of God, the place where he lives, not we live. Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right? That plan got lost. Israel was on a collision course with God. All right? So the Philistines figure this thing out, and they go, this is not good. This, we got to get rid of this Ark of the Covenant thing. So they put it, put it on a cart with some uh, oxen, and they, 
hit the oxen, they bring it right up to the edge of the land of the Philistines and they aim it toward Israel. <laughs> and they hit it and say, go, shoo, get out of here, go. And of course the cattle start walking, you know, and they're just going. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the, the story only gets worse. It, it ends up with a bunch of Levites. And these Levites, instead of going, oh man, we're the... You know, we're of the house of Aaron. We know what to do with the ark. We need to put it in a habitation. They, they start going, well, I wonder what's inside that box. I wonder what's in there. Well, let's look. Not really a, you know, good idea that way. So they do, and a bunch of them die. And so it ends up in this guy's home named Obed-Edom. I don't, from my study, I don't even think he's a Jew. I don't even think he's Jewish. But he brings it into his home, which is better than what the others were doing. He's given it a habitation. And this is verse, uh, what, what did I say? Um, 10. So David would, let's see. Well, let me, let me go ahead and let me make sure. Yeah, okay, verse 10. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. All right. So that happened as a result of David becomes king. And David says, I mean, he's king. Now, now, folks, if you were king, what would be the first thing you would do? Go kill your enemies or something, build you something. David becomes king, and the first thing he wants to do is, we've got to get the ark back here. No, that's not what he said. That is not what he said, and that's not what he thought. What he thought was, I need to join the ark and a house and make that central to Israel. The house and the ark, which is God himself living within the house. I need to bring those two back together because he began to, he began to hear this in Bethlehem. He found it in the woods. He realized this whole thing was a fiasco. They don't even know what they're doing with it. I do, even though he messed up on how to carry it. I do. What he didn't understand is beasts can't carry the ark. <clears throat> Priests, not beasts. You need a big sign that says that. <laughs> priests, not beasts. Because many that look like priests are beasts. But <clears throat> that's another story. So he says he's got one thing on his heart. The first thing he does when he becomes king has to do with the ark getting in a house. The last thing he does when he's, still, when he's been king all those years, finishing off Solomon's temple, getting the, thing, getting the ark in the house. He spent his whole life gathering the materials for the temple of Solomon. He spent his whole life, everything basically that he did, he was working toward getting God in the house finding a habitation and working to build that. Most ministers are not working to build the church into a habitation of God. <clears throat> it's not even there. They're trying to get numbers. That building the house, building the church, it's, it's another thing to them. Add numbers. Get a bigger building. All sorts of things. But David understood that we were supposed to be that house. And David understood that God wanted a habitation. And so, when he messed up, he sets it aside in this house of Ob Obed-Edom. And uh, verse 10, So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite, and the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. <clears throat> all right. Again, how do we interpret that? <clears throat> well, we say, 
if we were David, we would say this, not, not that David said this, but we would say this if we were David. Well, that guy has got the ark in his house. He's got the presence of God living within his house. And this is, this is what it's all about. And I, except I want to get him in my house so that I'll be blessed. I'm telling you again, that's a wrong motivation. And David recognized that. And David said, and I, I'm going to tell you the way the Lord said it to me. <clears throat> David said, I blew it on how to carry the ark, but I've got to do something. This is contrary to God. He's living in someone else's house, and I've got to get him in his own house. He's living in there sharing rooms with everybody and sharing the house with some, some family and all this. And even though they're blessed, that's not the plan of God. This is disturbing to me, David would say. This is disturbing. I must bring him up to his own house where he can live in it. It's his house where he lives, not other people. <laughs> you say, I never heard that before. Well... A lot of people never heard what David heard. No, his whole point was, I must not, I, I can't just leave him, leave him in a house. I'm sure it's better than being down in the Philistines' tent with the false gods. I'm sure it's better than, than Eli and Hophni and all the priests that claim to be priests and high priests who have no clue and therefore take him out of his habitation and start using him for their pleasure, for their, you know, making my house better, making my house blessed, defeating my enemies. Folks, that sounds like nominal Christianity to me. But David said, no, I know what is in the heart of God. I first heard of it in Bethlehem. And when I was out there alone and I didn't have a place of rest, I thought about God. And I thought, oh, my God. And the, the next phase, and we're not going to have time to get into because I was just signaling we're almost out of time, will be that he saw it in the scriptures. And oh, how incredibly persuasive is this in the scriptures that speak of everything, everything, everything that went before David and shows that this was God's real purpose all along. This was his actual desire, was that we, you know, speaking of the church, that we become a habitation. <clears throat> and so David says, I can't stand it. I'm serious. I can't stand it. I can't stand that God is still not in his habitation. He still doesn't have a house. David would say, I have a house, you have a house, but he still does not have a house, even though it's better. It's still in the house with other people, make, call him the shots, you understand? Obed Edom, saying, we'll get up at this hour, we'll go to bed hour, we'll go over here, we'll do this, we'll do that, and we'll ask the, the blessing of God, and they got the blessing of God, do you see what I'm saying? Because if the blessing of God is all that it's about, well, that seems good. But David said, no, I know better. I know that maybe that's what it's all about to Christians. But God is not getting what's in his heart. And David said, well, let's go back to 132, and we'll just read that and close since my time is almost up here. Psalm 132 and verse 1. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore. What is he talking about? He's saying, Lord, listen to me. He's saying, Lord, remember me and all the stuff I've gone through to try to, break, to make your people a habitation. Lord, remember all the trouble and all the opposition that has come. Lord, remember all the affliction that has come from me trying to establish your people as a habitation. Remember all of the rebellions that have risen up by people who didn't want to die so that Christ could live. 
Remember all the people who went their own way. Remember all of the affliction that came as a result of people not knowing your heart. Remember all the trials that I've had to face just trying to explain your heart to people who'd never heard your heart before. This is David. Remember all of the people who misunderstood because David was the only one at that time that had any clue about the heart of God and what he wanted. And remember all the resistance because they never heard it. Remember all the affliction of David that came when he swore, when he swore unto the Lord. He vowed to the Lord. David vowed, to, he said to the Lord, I, I will not rest until you rest. I will not just sit in my house and live my life while you don't have a house. I will not go up to my bed and try to find rest apart from you finding rest. I will live for you. And David did it every day of his life to build this habitation for God. And so when he finally went back, He got the priest to carry that ark and he brought it up and he was dancing with all of his might. Why? I'm just so happy I'm the one who gets to bring up the house or whatever, whatever we think, you know, as David did. You know, what is that song? As David did, we're going to dance like David danced. I don't know that anyone has danced in the church based on we're the habitation of God. It's Christ in us. We're dead. Let's dance. Yeah. Woo Praise him, people. Don't tell me you're dancing as David danced. The Bible said he danced with all his might. The Lord is coming into his habitation. It's happening. I vowed that this would happen. I, you know. And he brings it in there. And uh, let's see. It's, it's not here. But I was reading in the scriptures when he made that vow. And Nathan went and prayed and came back with the message from the Lord. And told him what the Lord said. Told him the response of the heart of the Lord who said... And you can read it. My Lord. It's the word house over and over. House, 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 house. It was in your heart. You, you desired to do this thing, to build me a house. He just talks about it all the time. He says, where did you get this from? Nobody else knew it. Nobody in Israel knew it. You know what it says when God finishes talking? It says, David got up and went into the tent. What tent? David's tabernacle the Holy of Holies, straight in. It says David went in and sat before the Lord. He sat before the Ark of the Covenant. He was of the house of Judah. He wasn't of the tribe of Aaron or Levi. He walks in and he sits down and he talks with the Lord and he says, what am I and how could you, you know, what great thing. And of course it all pertains to the fullness of Christ and I'm telling you it does. Not us, not Christianity. We're not the fulfillment of it. Christ in us is the fulfillment of it. And he sits before the Lord and he just says, what kind of there's none like you. I mean, these are where those words came from. And he's just overwhelmed because he say, he's vowed, I will not give rest. And God says, don't worry, I'll give you rest. And I'll build you a house. <laughs> All right. Well, I need to end. I hope that Stephanie will be glad that I went at least an hour. My Lord. My Lord, folks. If there's any truth to this, if there's any truth to this at all, Christianity is following Eli and Phineas and Hophni and they're taking sacrifices for themselves. You remember what they did. 
And instead of it being to God, a whole burnt offering is supposed to be burnt to God. They would offer whole burnt offerings and they would take a portion of it. Then it wasn't whole burnt to God. They're getting something out of it. They're living their own life. There's not a death. They're not acknowledging the sacrifice of Christ. Let's stand together. Maybe I could have someone pray, uh, whoever does, if though, for those who would like to be included in the prayer. We're not going to have an altar call or anything like that. I'm just going to have someone pray. <clears throat> I would like to be included in the prayer. And with all my heart, I would like to see God move in such a way in my life that it's no longer just preaching good sermons. Whoever, if, you, if, you're, if God's tapping you on the shoulder to pray, please remember this. I just, I have been honored around the world for my sermons and preaching and the, the handling of the Word of God. I'm, I'm sick of it. I just want somebody to be changed. I just want somebody that Christ can, can inhabit that we can become a habitation of God. I just want to, when I go to these places, I don't want them to be impressed with what I share. I want them to get hold of the Lord according to His heart. And many of them will hear it and say, well, that, they'll bear witness. Yeah, that must be true. But they don't get changed. I am ineffective. Somebody needs to pray for me. So is there anybody here that would be willing to pray? Close us out. Kelly? Okay.
No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. With the cross before me, and the world behind me, with the cross before me, and the world behind me, with the cross before me, and the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Father, dismiss us now in your presence and let your spirit be upon us in dealing and opening your heart, not just your word. Opening your heart and letting that heart become our heart, letting us become one in your purpose and the things that you desired from the very beginning. Father, without the Holy Spirit doing this, we are totally incapable but we ask we ask in Jesus name amen you're dismissed